ladies and gentlemen, Chris Agnos of Sustainable Man and Sustainable Human. So I guess first, first off, this was this was done uh, before Sustainable Human emerged. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll, 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 just, I'll just. Oh gosh, I have a lot of echo. Um, we're hearing you straight over here. Hmm. Okay, let me turn down my 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 sound. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. No. Okay, so how about can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to turn off my sound so I can't hear you, and that should work. So type to me if you want to get my attention. <laughs> okay. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, so How Wolves Change Rivers, this was our most viral video that we've created. So as part of this effort at Sustainable Man, which I'll tell you a little bit about in the future, uh, a little bit later, uh, uh, we, we created about 40 of these videos. And the purpose of these videos are to really talk about a new story that we can um, enact as a people. Um, and this story will help us to define who we are and also what our role is to play in the world. So I think you know one of the biggest things that I talk about a lot is the role of stories and how stories are really at the root of many of the crises that we face today. You know whether it's the crises of war, or it's GMOs, or it's um, uh, you know uh, the degradation of the environment, or it's racial relations, or whatever it is. At the root of all of these issues, I believe, is a story of separation. This fundamental belief that uh, we are different from the world around us, that we are separate from it. Um, and so we all kind of walk around as uh, self-maximizing uh, economic men and women, uh, and we try to maximize our own self-interest. And this is kind of the story that we've been told, uh, you know, from the moment we were born, and really it's a story that goes back thousands of years um, through our conquest of nature. Um, and so there's a couple of these stories that we that we um, uh, that are very firmly rooted in our uh, institutions and in our uh, you know in, in our programming. Um, one of these is the story of good versus evil. Um, the belief that there are good people and evil people, and uh, one of the ways that we have to make the world safe is by <coughs> somehow <coughs> getting rid of all the evil people. Of course, you know the evil people uh, can change context depending on what side of the story uh, you 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 reside in. So, um, and this story, uh, you know, what it does is it limits us. It limits uh, the the reality, which is that all of us are capable of doing both good and evil acts. I mean, there's things that I've done that I haven't been proud of, but there's things that I, I have done that I felt like were good things. And I think that that cap capacity is within each of us as human beings. Um, and so this story that there are just these altruistic good people and these, you know, very bad people, that, that puts us into conflict and in a an idea that we're separate, that we're that other person's an other person, and in order to make the world right, we have to get rid of all people who believe like that person believes. Um, and so that's one of the one of the um, stories that we've been told, and um, I don't think it's working for us to achieve sustainability. Um, another one is the story of progress and what progress means. Um, progress has been the controlling of nature. So back when we were uh, hunter-gatherers, you know, we didn't really have this concept of progress. Um, but as soon as we started doing um, agriculture, and we started having these big civilizations that arose from agriculture, um, we had this idea of progress. And progress was anything where, that, um, where we were able to control nature. So if we were um, able to um, uh, chop down a forest and put in a bunch of uh, farms to grow more food so that human civilization could grow, then that was seen as progress. Um, and, and today we still see that, although we're starting to challenge some of those definitions of progress as we're starting to realize the uh, externalities associated with, um, you know, uh, all of the all of the environmental damage that we're doing. That's ultimately resulting in climate change. Uh, that's kind of the big externality of our story of progress. And then, so, you know, another one of these methods that we've used is this story of control. The idea that, you know, um, you know for most of human um, existence, and this, you know, goes back 50,000 years, human beings were not the top of the food chain. Uh, that that's that's been a designation that's been somewhat recent in our in our history as human beings, and so for a long time we were the hunted, 
Uh, and so nature was something to be feared, and it was something to be um, you know, trying to, we need to try to insulate ourselves against the dangers of nature. So our, this ideology of control uh, began to develop. We needed to control the way that, um, you know, where, where nature was and, and how, how nature could harm us. Uh, and this has led to uh, the conquest of, of nature. Um, and, and that we're seeing the results of today. So, um, you know, these are some of the stories that I began to discover at, at, that I believe are at the root of many of the crises we face today. We believe in these stories, and these stories have an effect of, uh, of, of, of creating the conditions that we see, see around us. And so Sustainable Man was um, my attempt to try to get at the root of all of these stories. Um, when I was, uh, I, I came from a corporate background, so I, I worked in the corporate world for 10 years. And I became somewhat disillusioned with um, the, uh, these stories. They, they just didn't re resonate with me, and I felt like there wasn't anything meaningful in my life. And so I quit the job, and I thought I needed to go back to school to get a degree in sustainability. But then I started, I forgot to ask the question, you know, uh, uh, sustainability, what does it you know, uh, what do you want to sustain? Sustainability really begs the question, what is it that you really want to sustain? And what I found out was what my college wanted to sustain was this global economic system, consumer-based consumer system. How are we going to make that sustainable? And that was their question. But for me, I saw that system as kind of the, um, you know, the driver of all of the um, uh, issues that are, that are causing now the sixth mass extinction in Earth's history. And so I felt we needed to sustain something different. And what I believe we need to sustain is life itself. Um, and so I think that's a very important thing when we talk about sustainability, to ask the question, what is it that we're trying to sustain? And, um, and that answer will, will lead us to different approaches to um, how we address sustainability. Um, so I think, you know, what we need to do and what How Wolves Change Rivers attempts to do, along with other videos, is to change the story of the world. Um, you know, we need to see ourselves differently in terms of how we see the world and, and our relationship to it. And so, you know, there's a couple new stories, I think, that are emerging. Uh, one of these, um, you know, is called the story of interbeing which is that my existence is utterly dependent and, and more than dependent, but it's um, intertwined with your existence. And the, one of the examples that we can point to um, where we can see this uh, evidence of this story is, you know, the fact that within our intestine are um, millions, if not billions, of microorganisms that we are utterly dependent on to break down our food and to digest our food and turn it into nutrients for our body to work. Now, are these um, microorganisms separate from us? Are they separate beings that are you know, autonomous and just trying to maximize their self-interest too? Or are we all working together? Um, do, do, they obviously couldn't exist without my intestine to live in as an environment. So we're beginning to start seeing that some of the effects of of, of you know all of these um, uh, different organisms that are working together um, really show that they're mutually interdependent um, beings, uh, and and really it's hard to distinguish now where I myself end and this other organism uh, begins because we are all we are all dependent on each other. Another way that um, these stories kind of come out of the story of interconnectedness. Um, what we're learning now is as we throw things away into the ocean, uh, we throw all of this plastic into the ocean, and it, uh, you know, the sun breaks it down into smaller, um, smaller uh, size, sizes, and, and what happens is that fish mistake these plastic pieces for food, and they eat them. And these plastics uh, can be bioaccumulated in, in, into the into the flesh of the of the fish, and then when we eat the fish, we're actually eating some of that plastic that we threw away. So we're realizing that we're not even separate from our environment because what we throw away to our environment eventually comes back to us. Uh, it's a closed system, um, and and so these are some of the, the you know some of the ways that these stories are becoming self-evident. And what, but what isn't what's happening is that we still have these institutions that are really based on the old story, uh, the old stories of control, progress, and good versus evil. And so. Um, 
you know, as our mind is starting to change, um, we're starting to become more aware of these stories of interconnectivity, and we're starting to realize that we have a lot more conflict with the institutions that still embody this story of separation. Um, and so, I've been working now on sustainable man for about three years. It's really just been, um, you know, me talking about having many, many, many online conversations with people from all around the world who are discussing these stories and their impact on um, our world. And so, what I realized is that all of our institutions that we have today are um, still based on this old ideology of control. So if you think of any organization, uh, all of them are trying to control their um, circumstances. Um, you know, they control how the money is allocated, where the money comes from, how much to pay each employee, um, you know, and everything, what products to produce, what services to offer, and all the rest of that. That's all under control of the organization, no matter if it's a corporation, it's a government entity, or a nonprofit entity. And so what I thought was, well, and the other thing that, that most organizations have is exclusivity. Not everyone can be a part of every organization. Um, you have to be accepted. So now we're creating kind of boundaries between people inside the organization and those outside the organization. Uh, and that, too, kind of embodies separation. Um, because I can see, I can associate with this group, and, and, and the other, and these other people are not associated with this group, so they are part of another. Um, and so, what I wanted to do with sustainable human um, is to ch ch take this concept that we're beginning to understand in our minds of interconnectivity, of interbeingness, and apply them to a new type of organization that we can all collaborate with, and everyone can be a part of. Um, from all around the world, and with the, with a mission, uh, a vision of actually changing this story um, of the world, so that the majority of people then demand to um, act in different ways. So, um, I guess maybe what I'll do now is I'll just tell you a little bit about um, how sustainable human operates, um, what makes it different, and also how anyone can get involved with sustainable human. So. Um, there's uh, <coughs> two ways that we can get involved with sustainable human, two high-level roles, if you will. Um, one is as a council member, and a council member is a financial backer of sustainable human, someone who believes in that we need to change the story um, and maybe doesn't have much time to contribute, but, you know, can contribute. And so uh, there's a minimum donation of $1 per month, and it gets down to that low level. So. We're looking to get, you know, what if we could get millions of people to donate one dollar a month? You have a pretty good sized budget from which you could actually do a lot of things. Um, so the di and and what what makes it different is that um, council members retain control over how that money is allocated, and this is something that's different from I think every other other organization that I have encountered. Normally, when you give a donation to um, a uh, a nonprofit group, um, you don't have any say over how that money will be allocated. Uh, they, they, they will they can throw a party or they can you know, do good work with it, but you don't have any say. And so Sustainable Human is um, a little bit different because uh, it allows uh, any, uh, the, people, the people who donate to Sustainable Human as a council member retain control over how that money is allocated. So no money can be allocated from Sustainable Human without a majority vote of all of the council members. If they approve of the expenditure, then it happens. If they don't approve of the expenditure, it won't happen. So, um, in a way, it allows everybody to be a participant in how that money will be allocated. Okay, so then there's a second way to participate in Sustainable Human, and that is as an ambassador. And ambassadors are all volunteers, so nobody gets paid for their work at Sustainable Human. It's all in, as a gift, which I think um, is um, one of the ways we can um, move forward into a new a kind of economy, a gift economy, if you will, as, a, as opposed to a monetary or transactional um, economy. Uh, in a gift economy, we had these a long time ago. Um, you know, most economies were gift economies when we were at the small village level. Um, but you know, the problem has been in scaling that gift economy up into a um, global society. Um, and I think today there's tools that we can actually do that um, with. But that's that's another topic. We can, if you have any questions on that, we can we can explore that in the Q and A session. 
um, ambassadors are people who um, all can uh, contribute in various ways to various projects on sustainable human, and they can actually form their own ideas for projects. If projects don't require the use of any funds, then they can get started immediately. If they do require the use of funds um, from sustainable human, then they have to submit a proposal to be voted on by all of the council members um, to approve that project. Um, so in the short term, right now, as we're just getting started with sustainable human uh, as of a couple months ago, um, and we're ramping up our resources, um, we have a couple of projects. One of the projects is a content curation project for people to curate content to be posted on our Sustainable Man Facebook page, which has uh, 1.3 million followers now. Um, so to try to tell new stories um, in a variety of ways from a variety of sources. Um, and if anybody out there in the audience wants to get involved, they are welcome to as well. So um, everyone is invited to participate. And then the second project is a collaborative video remix project with the intention of creating many, many more videos, much like how wolves change rivers. In fact, the first video we're working on as a uh, collaboratively is a remit, is a kind of sequel to this video called uh, How Whales Change the Climate, which is a similar, um, uh, it's the same narrator, and so it'll, it'll provide a similar story as, as How Wolves Change Rivers. Um, and so the way this works is that um, people come together and they uh, collaborate on ideas for different video remixes. So you might have an idea for a video you'd like to create, and you describe it, and a few other people add some of their comments to that video, and eventually you propose a kind of create a well-developed idea that has a script, uh, and then we post that into our community, and we ask video editors film editors uh, from all around the world, people who uh, do this for a living or as a hobby, uh, can come to Sustainable Human and browse through the list of videos, these well-developed ideas with scripts and purposes and abstracts and all the rest of it, the whole intent is there. And if they like that idea for video, they would sign on to do this video with all of the other video producers who produced that idea. And then they would work in collaboration um, using a software that we have um, called Media Mod which allows for commenting on, um, on um, uh, iterations of videos. And so people can timestamp their comments and they can say, hey, I think this would be a better soundtrack or a better B-roll scene for, for this part of the video. And you know, many people's ideas um, can be incorporated into the video. And, and then from there, you know, once the video is completed, we would have many other people who, are, who have the role of video remix promoter. And so their job is to go out and to give away this video to as many places as they can, just with the sole intent of getting as many people to watch the videos as possible. So everything that Sustainable Human produces is given away for free. Um, to the world, and it's it's a way to create an abundant society bypassing um, the mon monetary system, which ultimately uh, creates scarcity and, and the um, and the mentality of scarcity, as there is always not enough money to go around by design. And um, so, you know, what, what 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 where I think, you know, what we need to do is we need to come together, and we need to begin to provide. Um, resources to all, uh, and, and, and through this mechanism, um, through our volunteer efforts, I believe that we can begin to accomplish that. Um, Charles, I think maybe I'll, I'll stop there, and um, and I'll, I know I said a lot, so I'm going to probably be a lot of questions, and maybe you have some questions, or, or the audience might have some questions. Um. But you have your audio off? You can hear me? I'm back on. I can hear you. OK. <laughs> uh, great. Well, um, yeah, questions from out there. Let's see if we can should I just turn this around. How? Yeah, you can try. Should we yeah, try? Sure. Is it from here, or is it this one? Uh, just, yeah, just turn it. Sure. OK. <laughs> so uh, I'll introduce you to our studio audience here. <laughs> uh, anyone want to uh, go ahead? Uh, no. Just for sitting in over there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any questions for Chris? So, I mean, how are people collaborating on production and storytelling projects with sustainable human? Sure. sure. Um, um, 
So the way I, I described it briefly, but but the way it works is that people come together uh, on ideas. So what's happening right now is. Uh, I kind of developed this idea for how whales change the climate, and we have a video editor who has come forward and wants to help produce that video. And so right now we're all in a, in a community where um, uh, the editor puts out another a version of it, and all of the producers come and, and um, contribute their comments to the video. Um, you know, they they might say that you know I think this this scene right here would be a better scene to show this type of whale footage than this one, and so then everyone will will comment on that suggestion, and then and if they agree, then they'll incorporate that suggestion into the video. So it's an iterative process that they go through over uh, maybe six or seven and iterations of the video to eventually, hopefully, incorporate many people's viewpoints into the video. And that's kind of the idea of this collaborative effort is, if I tell a story, it's going to be based on my own experience in the world. But if I can get a bunch of other people to collaborate on telling a story, it'll also incorporate their experience into the world, and thus be a video that reflects more points of view than if it was just created by me. And what platform do you, I mean, how do you physically organize that? Do you have an online platform? Is everyone mm -hmm. in the same place? It's yeah, so the way right now what we have is we're actually building a social network within Sustainable Human um, that allows us all to collaborate in a way that we would on Google Plus or, or, or Facebook. Um, right now we're using Google Plus communities as, um, uh, as, as a um, in the meantime, until that social network gets up and running, but that should be up and running in a couple of weeks, and then it will be much more easy to track all of these conversations within its own social network. Have you looked at using the uh, Sony cloud system? Because they've, they've rolled out this system where you, you upload a video, you can add comments to different parts of the video, so a lot of people can collaborate on the editing uh, process. It could be useful. I will definitely check that out. Thank you very much. But it, that, that sounds like very similar to, to the Media Mobs um, platform, though, that you were describing. Yeah, it's possible. I haven't seen Sony Cloud, but um, you know, I'm always looking for better tools than the ones I already have. You know, it's possible, so we'll see. Um, I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, I think maybe uh, maybe that went by kind of quick in the flow. But oh, um, one second, Joel. Was about the media mob. Maybe you could just kind of um, uh, explain briefly again about that and 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 uh, talk talk about media mobs just for a second because I think that's that's pretty cool. Sure. Media mobs is a platform. Um, a, you know, a software as a service platform, um, and and they're a network of video producers from around the world. Um, so the whole idea is that if you needed a video shot in Hong Kong, but you're in uh, you're in Switzerland, you know, instead of flying your whole film crew over to Hong Kong to do the shot, you could hire somebody through the Media Moms network to produce the film that you needed to be shot there. If it was an interview or whatever else, you could hire somebody, and therefore you could save money on the travel and save uh, uh, carbon emissions as well. Um, so uh, and so, and they have a bunch of online tools to help the facilitation of teams from around the world. So uh, they have a workspace that, that keeps um, all of the different video elements, all the different video elements in there. And then they have a screening room process which allows you to upload a video and then annotate um, uh, comments to specific points in the video so that you can say like, from 215 mark to 218 mark, I want to replace this scene with this scene. And, um, and so it, it makes it very easy to offer suggestions in that, in that screening room. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So we had another question from over here. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Hi, Chris. Sure. 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 Um, so I like the intro that you gave tonight about uh, changing a story as mm -hmm. uh, a way to make an impact. I mm -hmm. wondered what is sustainable man or sustainable human doing to help people tell their story or tell a different story. Mm -hmm. because what I've heard tonight a lot is is uh, volunteerism and crowd crowdsourcing and, and crowdfunding 
to create these professional or semi-professional uh, videos and content when isn't at the heart of this, uh, at least in my estimation, a, a different kind of story that's out there. And whether you crowdsource it or, or solicit it directly, you know, from a, a writer or, or a screenwriter or whoever, um, it seems to me that unless you help people tell their story or how to tell their story, you're leaving a lot of, uh, what's, the, what's the example, leaving a lot of money on the table. You're, you're not taking advantage of what really is available. It's not a monetary thing. It's it's not even a a, a structural thing. Yeah, it's this, mm -hmm. um, if you want to shift the story, you've got to empower people to be able to tell that story. Yes, and that way, I, in that I, way, they awaken inside themselves that new paradigm, right? I fully agree with you, um, and I think that what we will be launching a project on Sustainable Human to do exactly that, to enable people to tell their own stories, um, you know, about certain topics perhaps, um, but, um, you know, this is the beautiful part about Sustainable Human is that I've removed control from it, so, the, so, so whatever somebody needs Sustainable Human, they can collaborate with others to propose projects that then other people in the community can volunteer here to help create. So if you wanted to join Sustainable Humans to enable a project so that people could tell their own stories, then, but you know, you might not know how to create a website or to do all of the coding that's necessary or whatever. We all have various skills and expertise, but as we come together in teams, we'll be able to collaborate to create these things. So I know some work, you know, some developers who are joining as well who will help us develop the, the technical capacity to do exactly what you're saying, to capture people's stories. You know, and I think there's a great example of, uh, of this, of exactly what you're talking about um, on Facebook, actually, and it's a page called Humans of New York. You guys might want to check it out. But what he does is a photographer who just walks around the city, and all he does is take a, he just stops uh, random people and takes pictures of them and then asks them to tell their story. And he, has, he must have a really good editor because all of the stories are always really, really well done. But what actually just happened is he got sponsored by the United Nations to go to Iraq and Syria to start telling the stories of people over there. And so for the last couple of months, he's been telling stories of individual people in these, in these areas. And what it's doing is helping bring out the humanity. And it's changing so many people's minds um, about people in other countries because it's humanizing them. It's giving them their human story that they can now relate to. Because all, before this, all they could relate to is the single story being told by the media, um, which is, you know, they're all terrorists or something. You know, and, and so without any other experience, it becomes very easy to, to, to fall into this idea of the single story of a single of a place. We only have, we've only heard one story coming out of there, and so we only believe that one. But what this Humans of New York is doing, and what I would love to do as a part of Sustainable with Human, uh, is to be able to tell our individual stories. But I also think that it's important to tell our collective stories. Who are we as a people? in addition to who are we as individuals. Um, and so those individual stories will help tell the collective story as well. Um, um, but, but I think they're both very important. Thank you. Sure. Um, so hopefully you mentioned, you mentioned before um, uh, the, like, the common themes that are, that are coming through in, uh, in what to see as, a, as, a, as, as the crisis uh, with a society, for example, you mentioned then the, the, the us and them, the control and the progress as common, common threads for uh, the status quo. Uh, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, what, so to, to, kind of, to tell a new story then, um, or to, to, to enable a new sort of story that it come, to come about, it, uh, do you propose new themes? Uh, are there themes like uh, the indirect, um, in, indirect answer to these, uh, to these um, uh, common yeah. themes, yeah. Or, or, or is it something that you hope will just come, just come through by the community themselves and just kind of let the thing uh, run itself and see if it kind of auto creates answers? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I know. I, I think that I mentioned a few of the new stories uh, that are that are coming about. The story of interbeing, the story of interconnectedness, uh, realizing that um, uh, there is no separation uh, between us. I think you know there's a lot of uh, new sciences that are actually coming out and, and confirming a lot of this stuff. Is quantum realm uh, showing us that you know it's not as deterministic as the world, the, the nature of the universe isn't as deterministic as we thought it was. Um, that there's some kind of element of uh, individual uh, choice, uh, consciousness, um, and and so um, you know these. But these stories, uh, you know, the story of control, for example. There's the opposite of control. Uh, why do I want to control everything? Well, it's because I feel threatened. Um, I, I don't trust. I don't trust the world to provide for me. I, I see nature as something that is a threat to me. And that's kind of been our story of nature for a long time. There's been a lot of threats out there. Um, um, and so what we've tried to do is control it. Um, but the opposite, what would be the opposite of the story of control? I think it would be the story of trust. Um, if I trust that everything's going to work out all right, um, then I don't need to control it. Um, so you know, how does this work? Maybe maybe I don't need to tear down all of the rainforests. Maybe the rainforests are meant to be there. But you know, there's the ideas of permaculture. Perhaps some of you are, are aware of the permaculture trend, which is to um, which is really a uh, a different way of looking at the world. Not as how can I rearrange the world to as to do as my liking, or however that may be. Whether it's you know growing crops in certain areas that aren't supposed to grow there, that take too much water resources for that particular area and instead looking at the area and deciding deciding which crops or which ways which how can I enhance the natural elements of this ecosystem so that it can produce um, more um, it, it can create better conditions for life to thrive and when life thrives the natural um, output of that is an abundant system um, we'll see a lot more food production, um, but of course it would take a lot more people involved in that. So it's not as efficient from a dollar point of view, but it is much more efficient from um, a land use point of view. Got one more question for you, Chris. Sure. sure. Um, I was I'm thinking of one fiction story and one nonfiction writer who probably fit very, very well into your um, into your world. I was wondering about, I don't know, like Jared Diamond, for example, and his, mm -hmm. and his um, nonfiction books. Um, because he's such a, he's a history buff, he likes to write history that I think fits to probably an overlapping audience to the people who are um, following Sustainable Human. And also, there's this book I read when I was 13 that really stuck with me called Ishmael. And it mm -hmm. tends to um, fit into a lot of this sort of American environmentalism. Um, interconnected uh, species, ideals, um, and stories. And I'm just wondering, because these stories exist, and because there's so much, I don't know if they fit into the European like, reading culture, but they definitely fit into the American reading culture, um, if that is something that you guys are trying to partner with or fold into um, sustainable human in some way. Those are just two examples. Maybe you have others. Um, well, like I said, you know, Sustainable Human is really a platform for everyone to come together and to create these new stories together. So I could envision um, perhaps a project getting started on Sustainable Human that looks at some of these books and maybe reads them together as a kind of a book club and um, with the intention of, of creating some, taking out some of maybe the most poignant um, ideas in terms of memes that they can then be shared um, on social media. So I know, for example, we've, we've done that with Ishmael. We've taken a few of the quotes from that book and we put them onto a graphic and then we've shared that graphic along with perhaps a longer excerpt from, from the book and then a link to where other people can read the book. Um, and so, you know, the idea being if this quote that we extract can kind of stimulate your interest in this topic, then we give you the opportunity to then dive in deeper and read more about it. Um, so I could see a project perhaps on Sustainable Human where we look at a lot of these types of books that are um, able to help tell a different story and then use the, the material that we think is most effective at communicating those new stories and pull them out and then use social media to spread that message.
Publishers are really going to want to make friends with you soon. Uh, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Publishers will want to make friends with you soon. You know, I think a lot of different types of people would want could could actually still receive benefit from volunteering at Sustainable Human. You know, even if you're a film editor and you have a you know a side business where you do a bunch of corporate videos, you might get some exposure by doing a video that might get seen by millions of people, and then people say, "Oh, wow, who did that video? It was this person or something," and then they could you know find more information about them. Um, so it's a way to kind of uh, expand the portfolio to do things that might be more meaningful than, than the corporate videos. Thanks. Oh, I got a question. Just a quick question. Oh, uh, just for clarity at this point, what kind of stories are you looking for, for from people around the world, for example? I mean, we're sitting in Switzerland, and I'm sure there's a lot of stories somewhere in Europe, especially here. Uh, I'm just curious exactly what, what would you be really interested to have. I mean there's 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 it's there's so many topics, there's so many ways that we can communicate about this new new story. You know, the new story is really kind of um, many stories. Uh, it's it's the dissolution of the single story. Uh, you know, if you think about how Western civilization works is, you know, we all go to school and then we're all taught the same things and we have this factory model of schooling and with the, the whole intention of creating, um, you know, uh, obedient workers who can then go out and capable workers to go work in a factory or something. But that, that whole world is dissolving at this point as factories become automated. We just don't need that type of uh, person anymore and yet, you know, we're still creating these kind of um, um, uh, you know what this model where everyone's the same. So in any way that you can demonstrate your uniqueness in the world, the way the thing ways that you see the world differently, you are telling the new story. You're saying that um, you know uh, that the conformity to the norm is actually the old story. Whereas you know, however, I can express my individuality um, and my uniqueness, you know, is is part of the new story because we're all very unique, but yet we're all connected at the same time. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think there's a whole bunch of people who are doing really interesting things. One of one of the sustainable human um, subscribers' name is Peter Sharp, and what he does is he goes out into the world and creates experiences for people. So one of the things he did was he went out and sold lemonade uh, at, on the street, except uh, he didn't he wouldn't accept any money for his lemonade. So if someone came to his lemonade stand and says, yeah, I'd like some lemonade, and they said, uh, well, and he says, okay, and they say, how much? And he's like, well, I don't, I don't accept money. And so, so people are kind of confused, right? It's like, well, what do you mean you don't accept money? You know, money's how I get everything, you know? Of course, I can't pay money. No, he says, you have to give me something else. And so what it does is it gets them to start to think about what else they have to give to the world besides just their money. And so he got some really interesting gifts. He got an invitation to go to an eco-village uh, for a night. He got someone else recited a poem in Russian to, uh, for the lemonade. So he was able to make all of these human connections. You know, and this brings up a point that, you know, because we have live in a highly monetized society, um, and and what, one of the results of living of, of living in a society where you have to pay for everything is that it creates disconnection, it creates separation. Because what happens is, I give you money, you give me a product, and we never need to talk again. There's no relationship that's ever built. In a gift economy, which I mentioned earlier, it's much different. I give you a gift, just just without any expectation of return. And, in, and, 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 and what happens after that is you feel grateful, especially if the gift was valuable to you. Um, so you feel grateful, and then what do you want to do? You want to give back to me because you feel grateful for the gift that you receive. And, and so this type of um, economic relationship creates a bond, and it creates a relationship um, that we need each other, and that creates community. So the more things that we end up paying for, the less community we actually have, because in order to have community, you actually have to need somebody else. You can't just pretend not really need someone to get together. That's, that's kind of like getting together to co-consume something, to consume something together. That's external, and you're not building anything together. And so I think you know one of the things that we've lost in this highly monetized society in the West, especially here in America, is that we um, 
that we don't have as much community and that and therefore we feel isolated and we feel separated um, and that contributes to this alienating story that we've been living and, and and so I think there's been a you know there's there's a there's there's a there's a response to that where we want to get to act more in the gift because by acting in the gift we actually get that which makes life really worth uh, living which is um, uh, uh, relationships you know our relationships when you think about it are really what's most important to us um, relationships to each other to our families to the world to the environment. Chris, Chris, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Uh, I think you're missing something about money. I, I do um, think you're right about this uh, materialistic world of uh, never, nobody wants to know anybody except that money. Okay, but you miss a point. As in, I got economics degree, so I perhaps my point of view is not uh, is kind of biased, but you have to know that money appears to facilitate transaction, transaction of, with. Among people, like uh, I could, uh, I want to to read to buy wheat, but I don't want to wood. So what are we gonna do? We have money. I will buy it for you. So it was a huge thing in, uh, in a way to uh, improve trade and, in fact, community too. So uh, there is a perfect effect about money. Mm -hmm. And it, it will reach a point where is yeah, money has become bullshit, frankly. But uh, at the, at the beginning, it wasn't really like this. Right. right. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps there's perhaps a proper there's role for money. Um, there's there are certain transactions that make sense for money. Um, but perhaps you know when you think about like one of the things that happened when I grew up, you know, uh, when I was nine or ten years old, I used to go out and I used to play outside all day on my bike. I used to ride by myself. This was before there were cell phones or any way for my parents to find me. Uh, if there was an emergency, and I and I could do that freely. And today, you can't do that. Um, at least in America, <laughs> you can be in trouble for doing that. You let your kid play outside alone, a nine-year-old child. Um, and, uh, and 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 so you know, what do they do now? We pay for childcare. We pay other people to watch our kids. Something that is one of the most intimate things that we could do, uh, which is why, which is taking raising our children, has now been removed from us and is now into the realm of the transaction. Uh, and there's a lot of other areas I think where where this this phenomenon is happening. And and so yeah, you know, we, but, but you know, you know, even to your point, um, you know, that it's helped facilitate trade and community in the past. I think that um, there's other ways to do it because our monetary system is a scarcity-based system. There's all, we are all in competition for never enough money simply by the nature of the way that money is created. So it, it creates an, um, we take this abundant world, this, this world that's capable of producing for all, and we filter it through this scarcity-based economic system in which all of us then look at the world as if there's not enough. And so when you look at the world as if there's not enough, one of the natural responses to that is greed is to want to get as much as I can for myself so that I can insulate myself against future um, uh, against future uh, you know uh, potential you know bad things happening economic crash um, uh, natural disaster um, better that I have a second home somewhere so that I can escape in case something happens to this home now I have more security you know some people can look at all of this firing as greed but it actually makes quite a bit of logical sense given the scale scarcity of the economic system that we have. You know, nobody's designing a cure for the Ebola virus because there's no market to sell it to. Um, and so there's a lot of things out there that um, don't get addressed because there's no market to make a profit from. And I think that what we need to do is to create systems of abundance. And that's kind of the what I'm trying to eventually get at with Sustainable Human. In the, in the initial phases, yes, all we're doing is creating videos um, and content to try to change the story, but hopefully what we're going to be doing with that is attracting more people to come towards this organization and, and volunteer their money. And let's just say we're, we're up to a point where we've got a couple hundred thousand dollars a month coming in. You know, who's to say we couldn't start doing physical uh, abundance systems where we actually buy plots of land and farm them as a community and then give away the food to the community um, for free? 
um, you know, with, and then, you know, more people getting involved, all of a sudden they're receiving a gift, so they want to give a gift back, and they want to start participating in sustainable human as well. How can we all come together to realize an abundant world for all um, and, and kind of bypass this scarcity-based monetary system? No, it makes sense. I fully agree with you. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Claudio. Uh, yeah, one. Hi, Chris. Um, hey. You, you answered one question already, so the other one was basically, did you ever think about videos um, creating a momentum to then create a project or a cause and to, well, mobilize the people to really create uh, an impact and combine it with the video, and maybe afterwards document it. This would, yeah, would be awesome content. <laughs> well, one of the ideas is, you know, we want to build up this media arm that's capable of creating content and then disseminating the content so that millions of people can see it. So whatever projects we do develop in the future at Sustainable Human, we will have the capacity to talk about them and get many people know, let, let a lot of people know about it. One of the problems is a lot, you have a lot of people now who are trying to do individual projects that nobody really knows about. If you read the, the book, I think it's called Blessed Unrest. It talks about hundreds of thousands of organizations, you know, small organizations of people who are doing things locally. Um, and, you know, a lot of people just don't ever hear about them. So what we want to do is to create this kind of storytelling engine that allows for our stories to be seen by, you know, a lot of people. And therefore, you know, getting people who, you know, might just come home from work on a given day and watch TV. Instead, they get on Sustainable Human and they start promoting some of the content um, and finding channels, distribution channels, for that content to be shown widely. You know, anybody can participate in Sustainable Human. That's the difference, is anybody can join, and there's always a role that somebody can play towards creating this more beautiful world. Um, so, yeah, I think um, it's possible that, you know, we could combine storytelling and video storytelling with projects that people come to develop. And, you know, just another point that comes out of that, it, you know, when you look at the way nature works, uh, there's, no, there's no, like, centralized authority that tells where a forest can grow. It grows wherever it feels natural to grow. Um, and 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 that's the way nature works. There's no, there's it doesn't have this kind of um, centralizing authority. So how can we create our own organization so that there's no centralizing authority? I'm not going to say you can't do this project or that project. Uh, I want people to come together and then you know kind of remove the net, you know the fundraising component a little bit from the requirement, and all they have to do is make a case to the majority of the council members that this project project is worth doing. And I feel like that what this does is it takes away the 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 hard problem solve, right? In organizations we always have these problems that come up that are really tough to solve. How are we going to deal with X and Y and Z? Um, well, at Sustainable Human, my the thought is, the theory goes, that X and Y and Z will be taken care of by certain members within the community who know about X, Y, and Z and can offer a solution to X, Y, and Z. Um, and so the idea is that we can create this community of people who together can kind of see the big picture. Um, when we have these individual organizations, we only have a few people with limited experience that can and can't potentially see all the pitfalls that may, we, we, may, we may or may not run into. Yes. <laughs> yes. Cool. Uh, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is cool. Everyone's in agreement. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Uh, maybe you could just break in for a, a quick uh, uh, web, web uh, address announcement just to let everyone know in case they don't wh where they can find out about this. Okay, so 
right now we, we're going to be changing the URL. So right now the URL is human.sustainableman.org. But um, I think within about a week or so we're going to change it. I bought a new URL. It's going to be sustainablehuman.me. So initially I was kind of piggybacking on the success that I've had on the Sustainable Man website to launch Sustainable Human. But now we have about... 80 council members and about 35 ambassadors who are working on projects already, and I think we're going to be ready for our um, own platform now. So um, if you want to check it out today, go to human.sustainableman.org. If you want to check it out uh, in two weeks, I would go to sustainablehuman.me. Yeah, or, or you can Google it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's no one else using sustainable humans, so it should be the only one that comes up, hopefully. I, I was curious uh, to hear a little bit more about the the remix process, um, and in particular, like like kind of contrasting before the collaboration um, started happening and after. Like, how's I mean, maybe it's a little premature because you're you're sort of in in the process of the first. Collaboration mm -hmm. project, but but how's it going so far, and and what can you say about the process? Um, um, you know, I can't really say too much about it. As, as Charles said, we're in the middle of our first one, but I can say that <coughs> it's a lot more exciting. Um, my brother, who is producing uh, How Whales Change Climate, and who also made all the other Sustainable Man videos, is is enjoying the process much more. So he's the film editor. So from a film editor perspective, it's really fun to get a lot of people who are volunteering good ideas to the video because you know, video imagery, video remixing is a is an art, um, and to put that perfect scene in to complement the narrator or the music, um, you know, and because what, what you do is when you, when you can find that perfect scene, you can speak to, uh, not, you don't speak to our minds, you, you're all of a sudden you're speaking to our other guidance system, which is our intuition or our heart. And so what happened in How Wolves Change Rivers and why I think it went so viral was because we were able to speak, bypass the mind um, um, and the way it thinks and speak directly to our intuition which says, yeah, that's the way the world works. Everything is important. All the species are important and they're important beyond just their direct effects. Uh, they have a contribution to give to the whole. And, you know, there's a really interesting um, concept I think, which is uh, James Lovelock's Gaia theory, which is the theory that Earth itself is a living organism um, that self-regulates itself. Um, and there's lots of examples about how, through natural processes, one would think that as the ocean started becoming more salty, they would have kept on getting more salty to the point where they would have stopped uh, being able to support life, but it didn't happen that way. It started getting more salty, and then all of a sudden the earth started creating organisms that could absorb the salt and maintain an equilibrium that allows other life to take place. And you see this kind of trend in almost everything else, whether it's oxygen in the air or CO2 in the environment. The earth kind of is a self-regulating organism. Uh, it, it creates organisms and new life to, for purposes to help create a homeostasis type of environment. And, and I think that that's an interesting theory and a story, actually, that would help us to come together as a common humanity, realizing that our purpose here is to help aid in the to create the conditions for life to thrive. I want to see it now. <laughs> oh, we want to see it, yeah. <laughs> it's true, yeah. Well, we have to remember that Earth works on a different time scale, right, uh, than our human lives. <laughs> um, something more to say about the social network? I know that's also just uh, about to launch. Yeah, in general, I think, you know, I think, I don't know how you guys all feel about Facebook, you know. I mean, I think we all kind of like it for certain reasons and then probably hate it for other reasons. And, um, and, and so I think one of the things about social networking that um, is very important to create a good social network is you need to have a reason for being there. Um, why are you all coming together on this social network? To do what? And on Facebook, you don't really have that. I mean, 
you know, in general at, as a, at a high level. You know, to, when you join Sustainable Human, all I do is ask that you are in alignment with this idea of a new story and wanting to change the story. That's the only requirement is that, you know, you're not, you know, coming in there trying to disrupt things. That you that you agree with this approach and this philosophy, and and if you do, then come on in and join and and meet other people who also are aligned with this philosophy, uh, because you know we don't want to you know battle you know people who are contrarians or you know people who are rooted in the old story of good versus evil. So you know as we come together, uh, you know through you know through that process, I think we'll be able to make some big changes in the world, and I think that the social network will help aid that because we'll be able to know why we're together. Why are we all here talking and communicating and, and working together? On Facebook, you don't really have that, so you have a lot of people with different agendas and just talking about random things, and it can become frustrating for me anyway. Uh, and so that's that's one of the elements of why I think social network. So if you have a purpose, um, then I think a social network can help um, uh, gather people and have people come and contribute to that to that purpose. Great, thanks. All, all the best with uh, with getting that going. Um, other questions? Chris, are you making CV4G? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't. I just it, it was the first time I, I I heard about the social network. It sounds really fascinating. Um, oh. Well, it's just the integration of BuddyPress. So. <laughs> sounds interesting. Thanks so so much for your time. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's it's really great, and uh, hopefully we can we can do more of this kind of thing, and and um, we'll for sure keep in touch and and. Uh, Get the archive out there as well. So, I'd love to. And um, you know, anybody that wants to come and one of the things to become ambassador, well, the first thing we do is we sit down and have an hour-long conversation about all of these things and ways you might want to participate. Uh, so, if any of you are interested, please reach out to me. All right. Fantastic. Great. Cool. Look forward to talking to you guys. Thanks so much. All right. Excellent. Woo! Yeah. <laughs>